to deliver your lesson, Mike, I'm going to introduce you to the students. So they will, they will know you as well, because sometimes if we don't know, we do not understand. <laughs> okay, so uh, for today class, for today uh, cultural understanding for uh, our class this afternoon, we are going to have Mike Ryan Lester with us. Uh, he was my classmates 15 years ago. <laughs> 15 years ago, imagine that. <laughs> That's a long time ago. So, and uh, Michael, normally we use, just use uh, to, call, to call him Mike when we met um, around the campus. Uh, so I will introduce Mike uh, for a while and Mike will introduce himself for more details. Uh, Michael has been an educator since 1995 in Canada, Korea, Taiwan, Australia, Indonesia, Singapore, and Mongolia at the University International School level in the field of TESOL. As a student, now Michael has earned, uh, a, uh, I'm sorry, Michael has earned a Bachelor of Arts in History a Bachelor of Education in Middle School Humanities and Social Science, a Master of Applied Linguistics and a Master of Education in TESOL or Teaching English as Second Language. In, in 2022, he will become a PhD candidate at the University of South Africa and during uh, his free time, he enjoys writing textbooks, giving tours to Busan, as well as walking and hiking with his wife, Carol, who is a foodie from Taiwan. And then <laughs> um, Mike's wife, Carol, was my classmate as well. So we were together a long time ago. So that's all a little bit about Mike. Mike will introduce himself um, more details. And then the time is yours, Mike. Wow. Well, you, you said everything. I don't know what else to say. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm originally from Montreal, Quebec, Canada. Um, it's a French-speaking area, but uh, there are over a million people in Montreal who speak English, so I'm one of those people. And uh, I decided to come to teach English in Korea for one year. And I'm 24 years later, I'm still here. Although, like uh, your teacher said, I've been teaching in many different countries around Asia, really enjoying my time here. I'm really interested in culture, which is one of the reasons why I stayed for so long. And yeah, now I'm working at a university I am also doing online teaching now because of, well, you know, the pandemic and all that. Um, ho I hope to be back in the classroom in September, but we'll see. Maybe it'll be January. I don't know. Um, yeah. And then I was actually recently hired by the uh, Pusan subway system or the Pusan Metro to promote um, exercise at, at the subway stations. So that's going to be a fun endeavor that I'm going to be involved in. There are 114 subway stations in Pusan, and I'm going to go there to promote health, fitness, wellness. I like traveling and I like um, giving tours. I also like walking, like Marlon said. So uh, it's, a, it's a cool endeavor that I'm going to be looking forward to. Yeah, and then I'm also going to be doing my PhD next year. I am not 100% sure what I'm going to study yet. But I think I'm going to concentrate on study tours, but not the, in the traditional sense, like where you would go to another country and sit in a classroom and learn English, like in Australia or, or Ireland or something. I want to promote study tours like in the same country, but not in a classroom. The students are going to go out and build tour programs and try to develop the infrastructure of Korea, because I'm really interested in doing or creating lessons that are very authentic. I don't, I don't think sitting in a desk 
and staring at someone who's talking for like three hours straight is very like realistic for the you know when you guys get out into the workforce yeah and i used to live in indonesia i lived in jakarta for three years i lived in jati padang near pasar mingu and i also lived in kamong in south jakarta before great nightlife in that area I had a good time i worked at the australian international school when i was in jakarta are you guys in jakarta or somewhere else you're you, you guys, your your microphones are off. So you're, I see you telling me where you're from, but I don't know. What so you saying. did work at Australian International School? Yeah, like you. Oh, <laughs> different <But> area. <laughs> you were in Bali. Bali Papan, yeah. Yeah. Where do you? Where's your university? What what city are you in? Uh, Bandung. Oh, Bandung. Okay, yeah. cool. Uh, it's unfortunately one of the only places I didn't go to. But I heard it's like kind of cool there, right? The the wet people from Jakarta like to go to Bandung because the weather's better, it's cleaner, and good for shopping, right? Apparently, they have like a lot of outlets or something. I heard, and and famous for rabbit satay, right? Yes, Is that what, yes. I, I love satay. There was so I I used to eat that all the time. Like I can't remember how much it was in rupiah, but it was like a equivalency of about ten cents US for one stick. And, I, and then I moved to Singapore where it was like $1 for a stick. And I was so sad when I was there. I was like, oh man, for this, just one stick, I could get 10 of these in like Jakarta. And um, I love the peanut sauce too. That was really good. Yeah, I traveled a lot when I was in Indonesia. I, I made sure not to go to Bali first because I knew if I went to Bali, I probably wouldn't want to go anywhere else because I heard Bali was really amazing. And it was, but I waited, you know, so I got to, see like lots of other places uh sumatra all over went all over sumatra including bande Aceh. went to sulawesi and saw like the the, the uh, really wild funeral culture there and like tana taraja and went to papua got to hang out with those those uh the tribes when trekking went to the malukus went k island and ambon and Oh my God, I went everywhere. Yeah, Lombok, West Timor, East Timor too. Where else did I go? Well, all over Java, of course. Yeah. So that was really fun. I unfortunately didn't make it to Borneo, well, the, the Indonesian side. I went to like Malaysia, Sarawak and Sabah and like Brunei, but I'm, I, there's still a few places left I want to go to. If it wasn't for COVID, I was actually supposed to go back last summer. I was invited to a friend's wedding and I was like, stupid virus. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, that's kind of like me in a nutshell. Not really. I could probably talk for hours, but um, hey, I, I heard you guys are going to ask me questions. You just like to want to ask directly a question or just wait until Mr. Mike explains something about Canada? Oh, right. Which I'm one do you like? Canada. Okay. Any question or just ask something that you like to ask, you want to know, whatever. Anyone? Um, well, maybe I'll give okay. you like a little uh, in introduction to Canada if you have, <laughs> don't know much about it. Uh, <laughs> geographically, we have 10 provinces, it's a very long country, and three territories up north where most of the people are like Aboriginals. And uh, yeah, like I said, the Quebec, where I'm from, is a French speaking province. 90, 80 to 90% of Canadians live within 45 minutes of the US border. So even though we have this gigantic country, it's literally like just one little strip. Like we all hug the border uh, because, you know, if you go further north, it gets colder. And well, all our major cities are like on the American border. Um, yeah. Canada was invented or <laughs> Canada was not invented. Canada was created in 18... 67 because before that it was a british colony and the railway companies wanted to 
build a railway from east to west, and it would be easier if Canada was a country. So they applied to Queen Victoria to keep please give Canada its independence. And she said, okay, there was like no war or anything, no war of independence, nothing like that. We were, we were created very peacefully. One of the only countries in the world, I guess, that was created in such a way. It's kind of cool. Yeah. A lot of, because of my accent, people always ask me like, where are you from in America? And I'm like, <laughs> you can call me British. You can call me English. You can call me Australian. As a Canadian, though, we're kind of fiercely proud of not being American. Uh, well, you know, I mean, that that goes back to the time I was born and probably even my parents' generation. But I guess recently, you know, I guess, well, we won't get into politics anyway. Um, yeah. You have any questions about our political system or like culture, language, education? Any question about the language system? Oh, sorry, the education system or live in Korea? Oh, sorry, live in Canada? Anyone? Feel free to ask. We just have to relax. Yes. Grace? Uh, sir, I have a question. Could you tell us how's uh, ways of life in Canada? Well, there are a lot of ways of life. Um, well, the original Canadians are the Aboriginals or, no, you know, we have we have many words for them, Indian, or, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, their way of life is very different than ours. Uh, they live on reservations, you know, and they have their own language and they don't pay taxes. They uh, just, they are sort of separate from Canada because if, if you leave the reservation, then you lose your um, like financial rights and you lose like other th things. So a lot of it, Indians like to stay on the reservation and um, they have their own food, which is really interesting. Sometimes they, they open up their reservations to, to Canadian, like other Canadians on, on for special celebrations, like a powwow. Powwow is when they have a dance, like a dance party, basically. They dress up in their traditional, you, you know, costume and, uh, it's a good chance to eat some of their food. Their food's really interesting. Like they, they hunt a lot of game animals like elk moose caribou deer bear even up north they'll hunt like seal and walrus and even whale so it's it's kind of cool opportunity uh they are unfortunately a, a little bit more poor than other canadians so like their way of life is very hard um yeah and then well there's the traditional stereotypical like canadian uh, like me i suppose that's uh, you know we just uh we we're a little bit you could say more conservative than americans in a way americans are sort of like very easygoing and friendly and very like outgoing but canadians are a bit more reserved but once you get to know us we can be very good friends the traditional like religion of Canada mostly is Christian, and but there are um, other religions. Like there's a significant Jewish population in Canada, and now that we have a, we have a lot of immigration, because our birth rate is very low. It's usually what happens when a country becomes very successful economically. Then it becomes like more difficult to afford to have children. And then recently in the last couple of generations, women have started working full time. So we have less than one child per family, which is really bad for uh, you know our population. Therefore, we have a policy of multiculturalism. 
So as long as you can, as long as you can bring skills to Canada, then we can accept you uh, for immigration. So even though our birth rate is quite low, our population is growing, but it's because we're accepting people from other countries. So if you come with great education, then, and you have something to offer, then you, we will accept you as an immigrant. So yeah, now Islam, Hinduism, Buddhism, you know, I mean, oh, there's a lot of religions in Canada. It's like when I was a child, you would never see this. But now when you go down the street, you drive down the street, you can see a mosque and a Hindu temple and like a Buddhist temple. And this, it's kind of normalish now. I was looking at my niece's um, school photo and there were like people from all over the world. It looked like a photo of like some international club or something. And I told my niece, I said, wow, that looks really interesting. And she's like, yeah, all these kids are Canadian. You know, they're born in Canada. They, but their parents or grandparents, you know, may have come from somewhere else. And that's really cool on, in, in the school, because I remember growing up, I got, I made friends with, people who were like from India and the Caribbean and Africa. And I got to eat all their food. So it was really, that was really cool. It's like a foodie, you know, got to kind of try different cultures, food and learn about themselves as well. That was nice. Um, yeah. I mean, far as family is concerned, you know, I mean, families are close, but not like, not like Asian close, you know, like I think in Asia, cause I've, you know, I've been living here for 24 years. So I'm probably, I've probably been living in Asia as long as you. So I know, kind of know a thing or two about Asian culture as well. And in Asia, I think a lot more emphasis is placed on family than compared to in Canada. In Canada, once you graduate university, you're pretty much expected to, you know, move out and you just sort of make your own family. And then, you like go visit your mom and dad, like, you know, for holidays or, you know, maybe once a month or something. But I'm different though, um, because you see, my dad is Jewish and my mom is Christian. So, so I was, I grew up with like, I grew up in two cultures and Judaic culture is, is very similar to Asian culture. So it was kind of, you know, I, I, I have, a, I'm, I'm very close to my family sometimes compared to most like typical Canadians, I think. Yeah. Um, ca traditional Canadian food is, is honestly quite boring. Like, cause Canadians don't really, they can't handle spice. Um, but now with the influx of like food from all over the world, that's really changing. I remember the first time my friend, he served me um, spaghetti and he put those, you know, like, uh pepper flakes that you get like at a pizzeria you, if you go to like pizza hut or something they'll give you like grated cheese and a container of like grated pepper red pepper flakes and he put them in my in my spaghetti and i almost died and that was like when i was 15 or something but now i can eat anything like you know uh there's no no nothing that's off limits for me now, like I said, I lived in Jakarta for three years, so I'm, I'm not again. I'm not the typical Canadian, but most Canadians are eat very bland food. Yeah. Anyway. Uh, yeah. Hope I answered your question. Any other questions? Thank you, sir. Yeah. No worries, Grace Naomi. I do Zoom too with my students. It's kind of fun to see. Sometimes students are outside or they're sitting on their balcony or like or like you, you're in your car. That's kind of, it's fun sometimes to see like a different background. I saw a student go outside and play with his dog and he was in the countryside. And I was just like, wow, that was so different to see on screen. Any other question? Anybody? Me, ma'am. Okay, go ahead, Dusty. Uh, sir, I uh, I've read on one uh, of the blogs on Google, and it is said that Canada has a unique tradition, uh, like Halloween, New Year's, Divi, and so on. Well, 
one of them is the Calgary Stampede. Uh, I just wondering, uh, what is that? This is one of the Canada's, Canada's uh, greatest traditions as more than 1 million people from all over the world uh, visit this even every year. Uh, could you explain a little about this tradition? And I just want to know what is the purpose of this tradition, um, how to celebrate, and uh, is it is this the uh, celebrate uh, through dinner or a concert or something like that? Thank you, sir. Sure. Yeah, great question. The Calgary Stampede. Well, it's it's a several day long celebration in Calgary, Alberta, Canada. It's it's one of the Western provinces, so they have a tradition of like they. They literally do dress like cowboys. Like people wear cowboy boots. They they even wear cowboy hats. That's when there's like no stampede, they dress like that. Um, most people eat a lot of beef, you know, like like a cowboy does. So um, yeah, and so for it's a celebration basically of their their culture for one week long. Um, you can go see a rodeo. Like you know, they'll have cowboys who try to ride bulls and. They'll, they'll, they'll use a rope and swing the lasso, you know, try to catch like a cow. And uh, they'll also invite a lot of local celebrities to, you know, give performances and concerts. So ex especially people who are from Alberta, any famous Albertans. Um, like in 20, 2010, in 2010 and 1988, the uh, Olympics were in Vancouver and Calgary. So when um, they held the Olympics in Canada, those two years, a lot of the Canadian athletes went to the um, stampede and uh, they sort of said hello and, you know, answered questions and, um, yeah, a stampede in of itself means when a lot of animals run in like one direction and um it's difficult to control them yeah that's what a stampede in of itself means uh yeah and there's good food available a lot of concerts a lot of drinking too i guess that's what you know people over 18 do um and there are other traditions other celebrations in canada that are similar like same same but different similar to the stampede in quebec city for example there's there's a carnival or they call it carnival and um but that's in the winter time and people you know do downhill skiing they go um they do horseshoeing cross-country skiing and uh, tobogganing they build hotels and castles made out of ice and it's just a week long celebration, but celebrating the winter. There's there's a winter celebration in Ottawa too. It's called Winterlude, and in Winterlude in Ottawa, that's our capital. Um, people skate on the Rideau Canal. So it's a canal in in downtown Ottawa that freezes, and then people go skating. Yeah, Montreal too. My hometown has a summer festival. It's quite f popular. It's called. Uh, the jazz festival so you can walk around downtown Montreal and watch free jazz concerts on the street and they also have just for laughs just for laughs is I'm sure you guys have seen it if you've ever taken an airplane or watch tv and you see these people playing jokes on each other that is called just for laughs and um that came from Montreal it was originally a comedy festival Yes, there's a lot going on. There's a lot going on in Canada. Yeah, especially within Calgary. Uh, that was a good question. Thank you, sir. Yeah, no worries. No worries. I like to watch Just for Laughs, too. Mm. <laughs> it's funny. <laughs> yeah, some of, the, some of the skits are really silly. They're great.
Okay, any more questions related can I, to Canadian? Can I ma'am? Yes, you may. Um, I have one question about some laws in your country. What are some laws in your country, sir, in Canada? Some laws? Well, um, it growing up, it was the strangest thing. Um, it, well, I suppose it wasn't strange. Um, let me take that back. Okay. J drinking outside is illegal. You know, like say, for example, if you brought beer or alcohol to a park, the police would give you a ticket, pour your beer out, say, mm, bad, you know, don't drink in public. Um, but now under the current, um, like, current uh, administration that our leader is a prime minister named uh, Justin Trudeau and he has legalized marijuana. So the, it's very unusual. I'm not used to it, you know, cause I don't live in Canada, but um, I went home, I saw some stores and they're run. Some of them are private and some of them are public like run by the government and they actually sell marijuana and you can use your credit card and it's, it looks like an Apple store. It's so unusual. Cause I mean, growing up, you know, all drugs were illegal, but now they're legal, something different. Um, we're on, now currently under COVID, there's a lot of unusual laws. Like in certain cities, it's illegal to go out, to leave your house after 8 p.m. So like in Montreal, where I'm from, if you drive your car, go out for a walk or something, and it's like 9 p.m. at night, the police can give you a ticket. And yeah, that's a, and if you don't wear a mask, they'll give you a ticket as well. So that's something new in Canada. Um, other laws, uh, typical, other laws are pretty typical just like every other country. Although one thing that's interesting is the province of Quebec because they speak French and they have their own distinct culture. They, they came from France and they're kind of different than most other Canadians. So they, they have their own laws that are separate than Canada's laws. So, you know, we have federal Canadian laws and you have provincial laws, but there's, but Quebec has their own set of laws that are, a little different, you know, most of them are the same, but they're a little different than the rest of Canada. That's one difference, I guess you could say. Unfortunately, we don't have like an unlimited speed, you know, like say like in, in Germany, you know, you can drive on the Autobahn really fast and that's okay. But in, in Canada, you know, I think you're only allowed to drive like a hundred kilometers per hour on the highway. And, you know, so that, that in, in Quebec anyway, people like to drive really fast. Um, but, you know, there's, there's some of the most famous Formula One drivers are from Quebec, like Jacques Villeneuve. And, you know, there was a father-son team. They were pretty good for a while. They beat Schumacher. Um, yeah, well, speaking of culture, you know, sports is really big in Canada too. You know, we have the Montreal Canadiens in Montreal. I, hockey is really huge. Everyone, not everyone, but a lot of people in Canada play hockey. We have the Montreal Expos. Well, used to have them. They they moved to th their baseball team. They moved to Washington. So we lost our Expos. But um, yeah, we saw, the Montre we saw the Toronto Blue Jays. That's a baseball team. They've won. Oh, and, and the NBA. The NBA, uh, you know, but Raptors, the, the Toronto Raptors basketball team, they won like the NBA championship, I can think year, one year ago. And uh, yeah, we have a soccer league too, football league. They're not awesome, but um, I guess they could probably be like a third or fourth tier in, you know, compared to Europe. Um, yeah, and there's a lot of traditional sports that, don't really aren't really popular but um like lacrosse uh, that was invented in canada basketball was invented by a canadian by the way Na Naismith, Naismith, i think he invented it 
but he's a Canadian. Yeah. Baseball, believe it or not, was actually invented in Canada too. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. Oh, you know, I'm sure you're, maybe you're interested in food. Food is a big part of culture, right? So um, every province has their own specialty. So like out West in British Columbia, they're, they focus a lot on wellness. So, you know, a lot of healthy food, organic, non-GMO, non you know, gluten-free, that kind of stuff. And then when you get into like the central and Western provinces, like Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, they focus a lot on meat because they're like cowboys and farmers out there. And then in Saskatchewan, there's a lot of Ukrainian people that live there. So there's a bit of a Ukrainian influence. Ontario is a mix of everything because, you know, Ontario has Toronto and there, there's a lot of people in Ontario. They're from all over the world. So you can eat pretty much everything in Ontario. Quebec, where I'm from, a lot of traditional French Canadian food could be like meat pie, not Australian style. It's a little different. Um, and they put salmon in the meat pie sometimes. And then when you go to the Eastern provinces, if uh, New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, Prince Edward Island and Newfoundland, there's a big focus on seafood over there because their main industry in the Eastern provinces or the Maritimes are, is um, fishing. So like when I was a child, my mother, my mother and father took me and my sister to Newfoundland and I ate uh, cod tongue. So yeah, it's like t a cod is a kind of fish, you know, and, and they deep fried the cod tongue. It, it was like kind of a cross between sort of French fries and uh, fish. <laughs> yeah, my, my grandparents were actually from Newfoundland and they would eat uh, seal. And they, had, they would eat seal um, flippers, which I actually tried a year ago in, in uh, Norway. Um. So, um, yeah, so Smima, do you have any questions? Mirna, do you have any question? Uh, sir, I just want to ask, um, what is the considered the most respectful or disrespectful in your culture? Hmm. Very good question. Um, well, wow, that's a challenging question. Thank you. Uh, something's respectful and disrespectful. Hmm. Well, I find it disrespectful when people interrupt me, which is a challenge because I live overseas. And a lot of my friends are from different countries where they like to interrupt you. So it's a bit frustrating. You know, I have Australian and American friends. I have friends who are from England. And, you know, some of us are very, some of those people are very outgoing and opinionated and they are argumentative. And I have, I'm friends from other countries where people are much more calm and uh, relaxed. And in Canada, we give everyone a turn to talk. You know, it's, you don't feel like somebody's ready to jump on you and just sort of interrupt you and that you know so like it's that that part's kind of cool they respect your your opinion so if somebody interrupts you that's that's pretty disrespectful yeah in Canada what's something that's respectful um hmm I think it's just important to you know when you introduce yourself shake your hand and be humble don't talk too much don't show off and uh yeah, that, that's kind of a respectful thing you might want to do, like the first time you meet someone. You know, just don't, don't let your guard down too fast. Don't play all the cards. Don't play all your cards in one shot. You know, like don't, don't reveal everything to the person. Just sort of take it easy. Yeah. I hope I answered your question. <laughs> Beatrix, hey, Thank that's a cool... Oh. Yeah, you're welcome. That's a cool name. My ma my grandmother's name is Beatrix. So, do you have any questions for me? 
Sure, I have. <laughs> um, uh, when we want to visit one country, surely we will uh, visit the first thing is uh, the tourist spot. So could mm-hmm. you please tell me, tell to us uh, about the best tourist tourist spot in Canadian? Can you make a recommendation for us? Mm, totally. Yes, sir. That I like a lot because I love traveling. And it seems like everybody knows about Vancouver. When I ask people about Canada, they immediately always go straight to Vancouver. But that's just one city. You know, there's a lot of places to see in Canada. So um, international travelers very rarely make it to the East Coast. But in my opinion, that's the best part. So I'll recommend the East Coast. The East Coast has like four four provinces. So New Brunswick, PEI, that's Prince Edward Island, Halifax, and Newfoundland. I would say like Prince Edward Island could be considered maybe one of the best places to visit in the East Coast because Anne of Green Gables, it's kind of a famous book and movie. TV show Um, she's from Prince Edward Island so you can go there and see her house and there's like a you know like a haunted forest it's not haunted but it's just they just say it's a haunted forest next to her house and you can dress up like Anna Green Gables and you can have a lot of fun there and the and the food is really good and Prince Edward Island is famous for having like red sand and red uh, earth so apparently that is very good for growing potatoes so the potatoes are really good and uh, lobsters lobster is really cheap so you can go to like a restaurant or like a church basement or something you can get like a lobster buffet or like two lobsters for like ten dollars us so yeah the food is really good and cheap out there beautiful beaches and uh, the world's longest bridge is connects new um connects prince edward island to no uh, new brunswick and um yeah so i'd recommend prince edward island definitely it's a little i mean it's not hard to get to you just have to fly to any major city i i seriously doubt there are any international flights to prince edward island but you just fly to a major city and you can catch a short domestic flight over there Newfoundland, if you've got the time and the energy, I would highly recommend it as well, because it's probably the most unique Canadian um, province. Uh, The people there even have a dialect. Of course, they speak English just like me. But when two people from Newfoundland talk, they speak in a dialect. And that is completely like I totally don't I don't understand it at all. I don't have no idea what they're saying. I guess it's because they're they're fishermen and they met people from Spain and Portugal and France and and then they were just totally separated from Canada for a long time and so some Gaelic or and Celtic language got in there so like there's some really interesting culture there too and and the other province is um, Halifax on the east coast. Oh, sorry, Halifax is sorry. Halifax is actually a city in in the province of Nova Scotia. It's very beautiful geographically, and it, there's even an island off of Halifax that is only populated by horses. There are there are very very few people that live there, but there are thousands of horses that roam free there. A, sh- um, a ship, a ship like crashed or like sunk, like hundreds of years ago and then this there was it was the ship was full of horses and the horses swam to the island and they it's now just known as like this island full of horses so that's that'd be pretty cool to check out i think yeah hope that's good (laughs) yeah unfortunately as well uh new brunswick always gets left out it's the fourth province and i honestly don't know anything that you can see there um so that's that's another reason why it gets left out. Nobody knows about it. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, sir. Yeah.
No worries. We will go there when we make money for that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> East Coast. That's right. Thanks. That's the East Coast. Yeah. Um, sir. Uh, yes. I, I am curious about something. I mean, I know that Canada is different from Asian, uh, but I was wondering about the school there. Uh, do the students have to wear a uniform like every single day or they can just use or wear whatever they want? Well, in um, public schools, students wear whatever they want, 100%. Yeah. Um, if it's a private school, then they'll, you'll probably have to wear a uniform. Uh, when I went to elementary school, they didn't have a uniform, but they had a policy like you had to wear blue or white. And uh, that was unusual. It's not really supposed to happen. But for some reason, that was just what happened at my elementary school. Um, but generally speaking, yeah, you can wear whatever you want. You can wear whatever you want. No uniforms at public school. Most people go to public school because private school is a little, you know, like quite expensive. So yeah, but public, private school, they do wear uniforms. Mm -hmm. Thank you, sir. Sure. Sir, I have a question. Mm -hmm. How about uh, do's and don'ts? Uh, I mean, what are the do's and don'ts in Canada? Mm. Wow. Okay. <sighs> do's and don'ts. My, so remember, it's been a long time since I lived in Canada, so I have to think about this for a little, for a second. Um, oh, you should always take your shoes off before you enter someone's home. Even though, like, you might see in a movie, like, everyone wears their shoes inside the house, but that's, remember, that's an American movie. But in, in Canada, that's a kind of a difference. Um, even if the person, even if the host says, no, 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 don't worry about it. Don't, don't take off your shoes. You should still take your shoes off. Um, it's probably best. Um, so that's kind of, you know, it's kind of similar to some places in Asia, like where I'm, I'm living in Korea right now. And in Korea, you always have to take your shoes off before you enter someone's home. Uh, yeah. And um, what else? Hmm. I guess when you, when you visit someone, you should always bring a gift. Uh, like a bottle of wine or if maybe some maybe um, a home-cooked meal like a dish that you can bring over if you're invited over for like you know a party or dinner or something um, oh yeah we also like it's not a big deal to go Dutch you know like let's say every person at the table pays it's not like it's not typical we're like say Oh, well, it's the oldest guy at the table, so he has to pay. No, no, we don't do that kind of thing. So, like, if there's, like, unless it's a family, then, of course, maybe then, the you know, then just dad pays or mom pays or something. But um, if there's, like, 10 friends who go out or two different families or, like, three couples, then it's normal to go Dutch. Um, yeah. Hmm. Canadians do not dress very conservatively, you know, that's, that's kind of different, you know, like some of the, I mean, you know, my mom's, gen, my mother and father's generation, they're, they're kind of a lot more conservative than my generation, but the, the new generation, they dress very openly, you know, and um, yeah, but you asked me about do's and don'ts, right? Um, Hmm. Yeah, you should just be respectful. Like, you know, so just, res they're not, it's not such a big deal about age. You don't have to call somebody sir or mister or missus. Like, like if you meet somebody 50 years older than you, you can call them John or Mary or Bill or whatever their first name is. You don't have to say like, Mr. Smith, Madam, Sir, I mean, maybe if you're if you're working in a store, and you're you're like a cashier or a salesperson, then you should call somebody Mister or Mrs. or Sir, Madam. But if you're like 
perhaps you could you should probably call your, your teacher mister though like miss for example my family name is lesser so if i worked in a high school then my students would call me mr lesser if i worked at a university then i'd then it'd be like doctor dr lesser or professor lesser it's interesting though because when when um when um, Marlon and I studied together in Australia, we called our professors by their first name. Maybe that was an Australian tradition or culture, but in, in Canada, we're not as close with our professors, which, which I don't necessarily agree with, but yeah, I think it's nice to be kind of on a personal level. It was, it was, that was different for me when I went to Australia. I was like, hi, Jane, hi, Darren, hi, Shirley. And I was like, Wow, this is this is different <laughs> yeah so like a few of you are calling me sir you don't have to do that you, my name's mike mike michael it's it's just that's fine yeah thank you okay. sure <laughs> Any more question? About Ning, did you have any questions, Ning? Hello, sir. Okay. Um, I am Michelle and I have a question. How about okay. the education? Uh, how about the education in Canada? In Canada? Because I hear, I heard from my friends, uh, governments of Canada, give subsidy from the kindergarten until the post-secondary school and the teacher in Canada has high salary. Yeah, from kindergarten uh, up, to you, up to high school, it's free. Everyone in Canada pays an education tax, even if you don't have children, but that's okay because if you don't have kids, you still want your neighbors to be well educated you still want people to have a good you know a smart mind and whatnot right you don't want to have an uneducated country so no one really complains about that um, even in junior college or university the tuition is is quite cheap compared to say america like in america you can you can easily go into half a million dollars debt before you even get your first job but that would never happen in canada you know we only pay I it, mean, it, it's, it's a lot more than when I was a student now, but um, not too much more. So it's quite easy to pay off. Like we might get a student loan to, to uh, pay for our university tuition, or maybe if we're lucky, our parents will pay, or you work really hard, you pay your own tuition. That's probably the best idea because you don't want to be, you don't have a debt when you graduate, right? But um, it's, yeah, it's it's quite cheap. Do teachers get paid well? That's an interesting question. We have a lot of benefits in Canada as teachers. For example, we get paid maternity and paternity leave. So I know that I know one couple that teaches. So the husband and wife teach, and they had a they had a baby. They both took two years off. Then. They had another baby two years later. They got two years off again, believe it or not. So they got four years off in a row, fully paid, because they said, "Well, this is this is my son or this is my daughter, and um, you know that's my right as a teacher." So uh, that was really cool. You know, I guess that's important. You know, for a, a child to have a parent at home for the first few years of their life before they're ready for school. And uh, teachers get um, a decent vacation, not excellent, but it's okay because we're, you know, we're, we're expected to do a lot of professional development in the summers and winters vacation. So we don't really have a long vacation. Um, pay is not that high really because our tax rate is high in Canada. Like 30 to 40% of our salary is taken away in taxes. But, you know, we have a good infrastructure, so it's it kind of give and take. 
you know, we, our, our infrastructure is very good. You know, if you lose your job, you get unemployment insurance. You know, if you retire, you get some money. Um, you know, our, our road system is pretty good. We have decent uh, Medicare. Well, I should say Medicare is free. Yeah, that's another interesting thing about Canada. Um, so we we do pay for our pharmaceutical. Like if we get prescription drugs, then we have to pay for that. Dentistry, dental work is not free. But uh, I'll, to go see a doctor or if you get like, I don't know, cancer or you hit by a car, you have to stay in the hospital a long time. It's 100% free. So that's, that's why our taxes are so high. Um, but like in America or uh, Europe, the teachers get paid more though. So like Canadian teachers, they go on strike a lot to protest that and they still don't get paid very well. But, uh, but it's a lot better. You know, when I was a child, I remember the teachers almost, they took a, a two month strike. So I had to stay home. I stayed home for two months which I, I wasn't complaining about, you know, you're in grade four or whatever, and you can stay home and whatever, just watch TV. That was okay. But, uh, but yeah, as, as it, the teachers, because they took two months off today, the teachers get a lot more benefits because they were fighting a lot for their rights. Um, but I mean, if you teach up North, that's different though, um, because of the isolation like if you go to Yukon, Northwest Territories, or Nunavut, which is which are the three northern territories, then you get isolation pay. So if you go up there, your pay will be over one hundred thousand dollars per year, tax free. They'll probably give you housing. So it's a really good position. Except the problem is you don't have sunlight for nine months of the year. So if you go the further north you go, the less sunlight there is. And if you're in the furthest north of Canada, you in the winter time, you get like no sunshine. But the opposite, though, in the summertime, you have almost 24 hours of sunlight. So that they have something called like the midnight sun. And you can you can go outside and play basketball. It'd be like 1 a.m. It's like night. It's like daytime. It's really bizarre. Yeah, concepts. <laughs> hmm. Yeah. So thank you. That was a good question. How about Chris Christo? Do you have any questions? Yes, I have, sir. Great. I heard that Canada or Russia is one of the most I mean one of the least populated country in the world. Is that true? Hmm. That, yeah, that is right. Uh, we are the second largest country behind Russia, but in terms of uh, population density, we're definitely one of the lowest, absolutely. Oh. Um, you know, Canada is, yeah, like I said, the second largest country in the world, but we only have 35 million people. So, you know, I think, uh, don't quote me on this, but, you know, I, I think that's, if you took like Mexico City and, and Tokyo, then those two cities put together is larger than the entire population of Canada. Or Sumatra, Sumatra has like 40 million people, right? So they, they even even one, one island in your country has more people than Canada. Yeah, so yeah, we, we, are, we have very low population, definitely. It means there are there are enough for people to feed on. Mm, yeah, yeah, it's easy. That's to feed. the advantage of little population but large country. There is enough for people to feed on. That's true. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have very large farms because we have a lot of extra land, and uh, yeah, there's a lot of food. A lot of a lot of big Canadians. <laughs> We eat well. <laughs> yeah, I'll never go hungry in Canada. But I mean, that's, but, but Canadian food is not cheap, though. That's the difference. Like in, like in Jakarta, if you go, to, or in Indonesia, if you go to a warong, you can, you can spend like 
10,000 or 20,000, 30,000 rupiah, right? And that's easy to have a good meal. But in Canada, you probably have to spend like $30 US to, to have a, a decent meal. So it's, you gotta pay a bit more. In a restaurant, I mean, if you go to a supermarket, of course, it's cheaper. Hi, Mike. We have uh, Sheffield in with us. <laughs> really? Yeah. <laughs> Just go on. <laughs> oh, oh, right. I see his name down there. Yes. Hi, Saifuddin. <laughs> wow. Wonder if, uh... Hello, here. <laughs> oh, it's like a, a, re a U.S. Yes, University of Southern Queensland reunion. <laughs> Yeah. Well, go on, go on. I'm okay. listening. Sure. So, welcome. Any more question, everyone? Anybody? I have. I have. Yes. Go ahead. Um. Uh, this is back about uh, education system, sir. Is the education system in Canada recognized internationally? Does the credit transfer method work? Can you tell us? Great question. I've dealt with this a lot because I've studied in um, Australia and uh, Canada as well as Singapore. And I also study, I will study in um, South Africa. So yeah, I've had to deal with this. Definitely, uh, I'd say 100% of Canadian courses are recognized overseas, easily transferable. Unfortunately, though, not the other way around. Um, yeah, Canada is a bit snobby, you could say, in that way. Um, unfortunately, some some education from other countries is not recognized in Canada. So, I mean, like if you're a Canadian and wanted to study for a semester or two in a different country, you probably have to check with like your university registers office to make sure that those credits were transferable. I almost did that actually. I, I wanted to study in Guyana, English Guyana, which is in South America, but I had to make sure that, you know, the credits were transferable and whatnot. So I asked my registrar's office and they were luckily, but I, I, I didn't go, um, but, um, but yeah, um, on the flip side, like if if you or your friends studied in Canada, I would say most definitely the credits are easily transferable. Yeah, we have two different kinds of um, sort of like higher education systems. It's interesting. We have colleges. Well, I guess I'm sure every country has them too. It's not that different. But um, yeah, we have we have junior colleges. Those are like two year programs. Um, in Quebec, that's almost like an extension of high school, one could say, grade 12 and 13, somewhat. In other provinces, they're more like technical colleges. We would study like something practical rather than theoretical. And then you can go to, you know, just normal university for like four years and study different subjects. And so I'd, I'd like to ask a question of you guys. Um, what, what are your majors? Or do you guys all study the same major or are you from different areas? Yes, sir. Oh, so um, it's, it's called in, Imtem, Inten, what, or Ange, Angelia, what is your major? Edu English education. Oh, are you all studying English education? Yes, sir. Oh, oh, cool. So you guys are kind of in the same boat as me. Okay, interesting. Are you planning to go? Are you planning to study? Um, sorry, are you planning to work at uh, an Indonesian public school or private school, international school? Do, do you guys want to start? Do you guys want to teach abroad? Like, what are, what are your plans? I have plan I, uh, to go to international school. That's 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 uh, my plan. My plan only. Okay, that's a good strategy. 
I think your 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 lecturer can tell you a lot about that. She, like we said before, she and I both taught at the uh, Australian International School, although different branches. Hmm. It's a good idea. I know I'm still in touch with the two or three English teachers at AIS. If you have any questions, maybe I can I can ask them to help you. That was interesting. Yeah, I mean, um, believe it or not, there are a lot of English as a second language teachers around the world that they go to other countries to teach like I am doing, but who are not native speakers of English. Like when I was in Mongolia, there were a lot of uh, Filipinos and even uh, Taiwanese that were there teaching English. I knew a Korean person in Jakarta who taught English. So, you know, you, you if you guys want to have like kind of an international experience, it's it's an option. Um, a very op open-minded principles will realize that it's not a matter of the accent or which language is your first language. It's a matter of, is the person qualified to do the job? You know, it's a, and it's a great opportunity to save money too, because, you know, you get housing and airfare paid usually. So it's kind of easy to save almost your whole salary sometimes. All right, any more question, anybody? Mister? Yes. I have question. Can you tell us uh, what are the differences between public and private school? Mm, good question. Well, generally speaking, you, I'm not saying that, okay, let, let, me, let me back up you get the entire gamut, like you get the entire range of students at public schools. You get students who like to study, students who don't like to study, smart students, et cetera, et cetera. At private schools, however, they have a very strict entrance exam. So generally this, you, the caliber of the students at a private school is, is higher, but that's because they have a strict sort of entrance policy. Um, the, the students at, yeah, public school, they accept everyone because it's public. Um, some public schools are excellent. Like the school where I went to high school, for example, still has an excellent sports program, for example. They have really smart students who score highly on all of their exams and uh, assignments. Um, and then you might have some other schools that are just, you know, sort of average, but private schools for the most part um, expect their students to, to put a little bit more work in. So one could say that if you graduated from a private school, the chances of going to a good university are probably better um, because you are putting in a lot more work and you were probably already a good student to begin with before you got in. Yeah. One interesting thing is like my niece, she goes to a public school. She's, she just turned 16, but a year ago she, she had no school because of COVID. And she wants to study science at university. And she was very worried that her that she wouldn't have the grades to get into a good university to study science because she what didn't study for like four or five months. And uh, whereas at the private schools, they never closed. They never closed for COVID. So she said that she was worried she'd be competing against people who came from private schools and 
yeah, so maybe recently private schools are better. Hmm. Well, growing, growing up, I was proud to have gone to a public school. So, yeah. Okay, good question. Thank you for that. Any more question? Maybe I'm I'm sorry if I butcher the pronunciation. Uh, some of your names are a little easier to pronounce than others. But um, Remanuela, do you have any questions? Emmanuel, I just asked you the question about the private the differences. Oh, oh, oh I'm sorry, between, sorry. <laughs> oh, between was, uh, private and public schools. Okay, uh, sorry about that. <laughs> How about um, Nova? Is Nova there? Nova is actually a visitor for our program, but I asked them to, if they want to ask questions, they are free to ask. Ah, uh, okay. I thought, uh, I think Jessica has another uh, has question. Oh, okay. Hello, sir. Hi. Um, uh, so my question is um, how the Canadians meet and greet with someone. I mean, is there any traditional greetings in Canada? Thank you, sir. Sure. Typical, typical is a handshake. That's the safest bet. Uh, although maybe in the last year and a half, no, but before that, a handshake. Do you do you know? Do you guys know the history of the handshake? Do you know why we give a handshake? Well, uh, it's because a long time ago in Europe, um, the knights, you know, the knight in shining armor, those knights used to hold their sword on the. Uh, you know, they would hold their swords on the left side. So if you like showed your right hand, you were showing like that you don't have any, or sorry, I, I take that back, sorry. Their sword would be on their hanging on their right side. But so if you show your hand, it's like, hi, I'm not going to attack you. Because sorry, left hand was like for the shield. So you would shake, shake your hand and show them I come in peace. I'm not going to take out my sword and fight with you. So that's why we shake a hand these days. Um, in in Quebec, though, it's, it can be a little different um, because the French influence. If you meet a if a girl and a girl meet, they can kiss each other on the cheek, even if it's the first time they meet each other. And if that's usually between French speaking Quebecers. And girl and guy can also kiss each other on the cheek. Not guy and guy. That's like that's like in Russia or somewhere else, but not in Canada. Um, in in like English speaking Canada, we don't normally kiss each other on the cheek. That is only for like you know family. You'd say hmm. that's one difference. Yeah, that's a. Or if you know someone really really well, you can give them a hug. I guess. Yeah. Good question, thank you. Thank you, sir. No worries. Anybody? Or perhaps Mike, you can ask them. Yeah. Are you are you from Bandung or is, is anyone else is anyone from a different place in uh, Java or Indonesia? Mostly they are come from Sumatra. Really? Mostly. Are you guys mostly from Sumatra? Really? Okay. Are you from Medan? Anyone from Medan here? No. Anyone from Medan? Yes. Me? Uh, it's me. In in ten? Okay. Cool. Yes, I went to Medan. Um, 
it's kind of like a big city. I guess it's a good jumping off point to like other places. Um, Medan International School, it's a good school. Yeah, I know that. Mm, good place. Maybe you could apply there one day. Uh, are you from Padang? Anyone from Padang? Anyone from Padang? No. No. Are you from uh, Bukit Lawang? Bukit Lawang, you know, it's famous for the orangutan reserve. Orangutan is not in Kalimantan? Also, yeah, it's also in Kalimantan. That's right. Yeah, there's another one there. Nobody uh, from Bukit no? Lawang. Are no, are you from uh, Bandayache? No. <laughs> no. B Bintang yes. or Batam Island? There are. Uh, there is one from Rio. Oh. Is that okay. Beatrix? Beatrix. Oh, Be Beatrix is from Rio. Is that Rio? Uh, precisely Batam. So. Okay. Okay. Are you from Sabang? Anyone? I went to Sabang, beautiful island. Yeah. Cool. Wow, Sumatra. Awesome. Best coffee, right? Mm. Yeah. Uh, so cool. Uh, so why did you choose to go to school in Bandung? If you're all, a lot of you are from uh, Sumatra. Why did you go to Bandung? Anyone? Let's see. Simima, are you from Sumatra or where, where are you from? Smirma. Where are you come from? Uh, yes, sir. I'm from. Oh, maybe there's a connection error. How about Lista? List, uh, where are you from? Lampung, sir. Sorry? Lampung, sir. Okay. Which island is that on? Sumatra, sir. Oh, Sumatra. Cool. Okay. Why did you choose to come to Bandung? Uh, because uh, my parents... Parents told you to go to Bandu. Okay, I see. Um, so, Hannah, hi, Hannah, I have a question for you. Um, are there differences in wedding culture from, from province to province or island to island in Indonesia? We have three Hannahs in this room. <laughs> oh, so Hannah Elizabeth. <laughs> So Unmute, Hannah, please. Uh, Unmute, Han. Yes, sir. Hi. So, like you know, like I said before, you know, I, there's so many different places in uh, Indonesia, right? Here, there's there's Balikpapan, Sulawesi, Papua, Java. I mean, do you think that the the uh, marriage or like the wedding day culture is different from place to place in Indonesia or are they very similar? Yeah, this friend said it's not sad. Hmm. What are some of the differences? Sorry. So, so Hannah Elizabeth, what what are some of the differences? Like, say for example, you took um, Komodo, you know that area, or 
not no there's nobody lives in komodo that's a bad example sorry lombok or bali is there let's say somebody got married in in lombok and somebody got married in bali would there be would the weddings be different and if if yes like how are they different Sorry, I think your your microphone is is off though. Unmute Han. Is there any differences between the wedding ceremony? Do you think you said that's different? So what is the difference? Just give the example. Just oh, give uh, one it's example. It's different. It's food and it's uh. What is there uh? Wedding in Batak and I think well, hey, one of oh. I think sorry I no, think one ahead. of the differences uh, one of that it will be the major point will be the dress if we do not have the white dress we are going to use the traditional dress. And then oh. it means that they will have different kind of wedding dress based on uh, the tribes they are come from. Okay, cool. So, you know, I, I work, guys, maybe you can help me because you're in English education. You, you might know the answer to this. Um, I teach, I, I'm a, I'm an assistant professor in Korea and I teach, I've been teaching in a Korean university right now for like six years, but maybe one day I'd like to return to Indonesia because it was, it was honestly my best international experience. Um, do you think that I could get a job teaching at a, a university in Indonesia? And if, if yes, do you think that it's a good, that's a good idea or? What, what's your opinion on that? Yes, sir. Just come to Nai. <laughs> yes, sir. Go on. It's very good. Oh, okay. So in Bandung? Maybe I could teach at your university. <laughs> okay. Yes, sir. Oh, that would be fun. I could have a good reunion with your professor. I could talk about the old days in Toowoomba. <laughs> <laughs> Tunba, Tunba, right? That's a nice, quiet city. Oh, quiet. That's that's <laughs> definitely a way to describe Tumba. Quiet. Yeah. <laughs> quiet. Yeah. Okay. Um, hmm. Okay, interesting. Are your classes big or small? Like what's the average class size in your university? For English education, it's just about 20 students Okay. For one class. Sometimes some will be just below 20s. That's not too bad. That's perfect number, 20 or less. Yeah, that's good. Okay. Yes, um, we have lots of time to practice one by one. Awesome. Yeah, or even even better if you do group work. Uh, so you guys tell me about, tell me more about Bandung. I only t I only know this you know this this the uh, sort of stereotypical thing about Bandung: good weather, rabbit satay, and and clothing outlets. But I don't know. If that's what everyone knows, right? I've never been to Bandung. So tell tell me tell me more about Bandung. Anyone want to share about Bandung? Uh, I guess who's here? Uh, Michelle. I think Michelle is the right one to share to us about Bandung because she's Sundanese. Oh. Or the original people of Bandung. Okay, Michelle. Um, hello, sir. Hi. Uh, Bandung has a cold weather. And then from the food satay, right? I think it's not from Bandung because is it from Madura? Oh. 
uh, but when you visit Bandung, you can try uh, seblak, but it's little, but it, but that food is spicy. You can, and then, uh, what do you want to know? Then hmm. I, you can try karedok, you know, Michelle. That's yes. original Sundanese food. Uh -huh. Karedok is actually raw raw vegetables, consists of snake beans, ca cabbage, uh, what I, what is that? Animal, uh, cucumber. What else? Uh, green sprout. Uh, green. Is that what is the other one? And then with peanut sauce. Peanut sauce. Uh, it's quite spicy for for sure. Oh no spicy and a little bit sweet because Sundanese food is mostly sweet instead of spicy. Oh, sweet. Cool. Sounds very anak. Yeah, anak. <laughs> you can go on, Michelle. Not, not, not finished yet. Uh, <laughs> like, and Bandung is culinary city because when you go to Bandung, you will find a lot of uh, food street in Bandung. Mm. Love it. I love um, street food. Okay. And then you can also try uh, Batagor. That is a uh, tofu with uh, with a peanut sauce mm. and many things, many more food you can try. Oh. Yes, Surabi, food. Surabi yeah. too. Is the how's the traffic there? Because I know, like you know, in Jakarta, it's kind of out of control, right? But um, is is the traffic pretty light? Easy to get from A to B in Bandung? Um, in Bandung, if you go to the Bandung, the traffic is normal. But when you go like to Unai, Parongpong, Lembang. Uh, the street, yeah. uh, Mem, itu naik turun apa ya, Mem? It's up the hill. Yes. Oh, okay. So is there like, I mean, this is, this is a question for anyone, because not just Michelle, but for anyone. Um, do, are there a lot of good, a lot of good um, opportunities for outdoor sports there? Like, can you, can you ride your bike, go hiking or something like that, swimming? Anything I can do outdoors for exercise? Yes, you can go hiking at Bandung. If at Bandung, you can go to the uh, Tangkuban Prahu Mountain, Gurang Rang Mountain, or Gunung Batu Mountain. So okay. in Bandung, there's a lot of mountains. Right on. Um, and like you, at the beginning of your... Um, beginning of this class you guys said a prayer so it's obvious like that you're uh like kind of christian university right you said seventh day adventist adventist okay is is that the predominant is christianity the predominant religion in uh bandung is that the majority or do you do you have a mix of of everything in bandung what's what's majority, the majority the majority is muslim Muslim, okay. Yeah. Do you still have though, like some Hindu or Buddhists as well in um, Bandung? Yes. Mm. That was the one thing I was found so fascinating when I lived in Indonesia that um, 
the recognition of the various uh, d d ethnicities and religions, it, you know, that was, it made for very you know, interesting cultural experience. Like there was recognition of the, the Chinese Indonesians, the, the Hindu, Buddhist, Muslims, or Chinese, um, so Christian. Yeah, it's a, a lot of holidays for sure. <laughs> Um, so how old are you guys? Are, are you guys all like the same age? Are you like freshmen, sophomore, juniors, or seniors in your school? Sophomore. sophomore. Oh, you're sophomore. So you guys are second year. Okay. Um, wow. So that's been a really interesting start to uh, your university experience, I, I should say. Uh, were, were you online last year as well? Let's see. Uh, yes. Ni Niagara, hi. Were, were you stud Niagara, were you studying online one year ago as well? Yes, sir. Uh, so you guys were, uh, so Niagara, were you a freshman last year and then? Yes. Uh, so, you, so you guys, so April, were you, um, have you been studying online for your whole university experience? April? April. How about Christy? Yeah. Oh, April's there. Okay. Hi, April. Have you been studying online for your entire university like experience so far? I... Yes. Yes. Okay. Like, like my students as well. Okay. Um, do, do you think that Bandung has a good nightlife? I mean, I, I don't, I don't go out. You know, I'm I'm very homebody guy, but I'm just I'm just curious. You know, I'm just trying to ask you guys some questions. I know you're young; that maybe that's something you're into. Do you think that? Well, I mean, it's probably not going on now, right, because of COVID. But maybe pre pre COVID, you know, was do you think Bandung had a good nightlife, or maybe you don't even know because it's been closed for a year and a half, right? Yes. Yeah. What's the situation there in Bandung? I mean, do you, do you get do you have a few cases of COVID, or is it is it a pretty safe city to live in? Uh, we have many cases. Hmm. Like here in Korea, where I live, um, everyone like a hundred percent. Oh, I should. That's that's not right. Ninety percent of people wear a mask, um, but like there's no social distancing whatsoever they just have no concept of social distancing in korea but they still the numbers are very low like we only get about between 500 to a thousand cases a day in a you know korea has like 45 million people like what in canada though it's really kind of out of control they're getting like 20 thousand 10 to 20 thousand cases per day I don't know. I don't quite understand why. I think it's just people are refusing to to admit that it's a serious problem. But what's what's the situation like in Bandung? So if we go to the city, all of us uh, are using masks, but some of the farmers over here do not do that. Or if we go to uh, the traditional market, then uh, they do not use, they do not use masks as well. So just like mm. just a normal before COVID. So, but in a supermarket like uh, or an, uh, at the mall, they have to. Otherwise, they cannot enter the uh, supermarket or mall. Oh. So Christy. Hi, Christy. If you go to a restaurant or um, like a mall, do they take your temperature before you go in? Uh, 
Oh, sorry, can you turn on your microphone, Christy? Can't hear you. So like if you, if you go somewhere indoors, will they take your temperature first? Uh, for me, it's no. Oh. For me, you... it's no, but and the other friend, maybe take a picture before I go. Mm, uh, and okay. uh, Mike, I have one question about Canada. Great. It's okay. <laughs> I have one question. Um, you know, in Indonesia, every year on August 17, the Indonesian people about Independence Day. I mean, uh, you know, if, if in Indonesia, every year on August 17, the Indo Indonesian people circle your river to the proclamation of Independence Day, starting from several com competitions such as Panjat Pinang, uh, you know, this this is, is one of the traditional competition that is popular on Indonesian from uh, in Independence Day. And my question is, so what about Canada? How do you celebrate your Independence Day? Is it is is, is it the same as Indonesian? Is there a fun racing ceremony? Well, in, Indo in Canada, our Independence Day is July 1st, and typically small towns will, will have like a fair, like kind of like they'll set up an amusement park. So it looks like a, looks like a circus. And sometimes people will have your, your, like their face painted red and white. That's the color of our flag. And uh, always it's always a day off. And then at night, uh, there will be the city will set off fire fireworks, so we get to see like firecrackers go off. And that's a nice show, and uh, it's unofficially moving day. So because July first is a day off, sometimes it falls on a Saturday or a Sunday. So then the government will give us the Friday off. So instead so we get three-day weekend so in that kind of case we'll move so you see a lot of people moving so like if you say for example you sign your your lease to live in an apartment or a house for one year a lot of people move in on july 1st and then so you see a lot of moving trucks around because it's a good day to move because you have the day off and you can use the weekend to unpack your boxes um, Quebec, Quebec, on the other hand, also has their own Independence Day celebration, which is on June 23rd. And that's called Saint John the Baptist Day, or in, in French, they call it Saint, Saint Jean Baptiste Day. And it, the only difference is it's exactly, actually, it's exactly the same as Canada Day on July 1st, except people will paint their face blue and white instead of red and white because the Quebec flag is blue and white. And that's really the only difference. Uh, it's, it's nice for me growing up in Quebec because then I got to celebrate twice in one week. So that was fun. Um, is there anything that's really, really, really cultural though? Not, uh, to be honest, no. It's just sort of a day where you like go to an amusement park or hopefully there's one set up in your community and you maybe get together with your friends in your backyard and have a barbecue and then you go watch some fireworks. That's what we do every year. Yeah, for Canada Day. <laughs> Although I should say, I should say in Ottawa, the capital, it, it's a little more important because it's the capital. So, so you can see some some musical performances, or you can see like, you know, the military will be marching and you, you can see like native Indians doing their traditional dance in, but that's only in Ottawa. Mm -hmm. So that's interesting. You said it's on August 7, August 17th, because, um, in, in Korea, their Liberation Day or like Independence Day is August 15th. 
and it's a very similar date in Taiwan. I, I th does that have something to do with World War II and the Japanese being defeated? Is that why your Independence Day is on August 17th? Or is that related to independence from the Dutch? Why, why is August 17th your Independence Day? Why August 17th has become our Independence Day, anyone? Tell us. You did learn about history. <laughs> okay, Christy, would you please here tell us why August 17th become our Independence Day? Because you mentioned that before. So now, would you please say, uh, tell to Mike what, why the 17th, August 17th become our Independence Day? Uh, you, you better turn on your microphone. Unmute your microphone, Christy. Or anybody, anybody can help Christy to explain why August 17th become our Independence Day? Anyone? Rimanuela? Because Indonesia are uh, free from Japan. Oh, oh, okay. That that makes total sense then, because uh, several other countries that I've been to, their Independence Day is on or around August fifteenth. So August seventeenth. Okay, cool. That makes sense then. Okay, that that's the date that Japan surrendered. That yeah, World War Two ended. And everyone's free. So, yeah. Okay, cool. The other right one on. is because of the Pearl Harbor. Remember that? In Hawaii? Yeah. I think that was December 7th, right? 1942? Uh, I think the other one, just before that. And then the bomb in... Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and that's the reason why we were free from Japan. Mm -hmm. Oh, by the way, guys, um, I've I've been teaching my students here in Korea um, about Michael Moore and his films. Have you guys? Do you guys? Can you just shake your head, no or yes? Do you, do you know about Michael Moore? I'm getting a few no's. Okay. Michael Moore is, is a, like a big lefty. He's a Democrat, kind of like a very uh, liberal filmmaker from America. And he's been documenting um, basically uh, problems that America is going through. And one interesting film that he created recently is called Where to Invade Next. And not necessarily like that American tradition of go actually going into another country and invading them, but uh, he is going to different countries and taking, he wants to take some of their benefits back to America. So like he went to Germany, Norway, Finland, Slovenia, Tunisia, and other countries around the world to look at what programs their governments created. And he wants to look at like the benefits. So I was, I was wondering as, as like, you know, you guys are education students, future teachers, future educators. And do you know about any um, European or uh, other countries like great education systems or do, do you have any questions about 
the education systems around the world? Because I, I do know a little bit about that. So I could, uh, maybe I can help answer that. You know, for example, Finland, Scandinavia has a really interesting, very different education system. So does France, Germany, Italy, and even Slovenia. You know, so I'm, do you have any questions about education systems around the world? Do you have any question? What about Korea, sir? Oh, Korea. Interesting. Well, Korea always scores very highly um, educationally, especially in math. They're always in the top five. But that's because of their test taking skills and their ability to memorize. So they're taking advantage of the, like, their short term memory. Uh, long term memory, not so great. Um, social skills, almost zero. Uh, they, um, they, the Korean students study from about 6 a.m. until, until 2 a.m., uh, seven days a week in the summer and winter vacations. So they, they, they have a very high burnout rate. Uh, the students are extremely stressed. They're, they, like their growth is stunted mentally, physically, and emotionally. Um, their teachers are really overworked. So they have a very high, like, uh, you know, they have very high rate of stress. Um, so they're, they're, they're very immature emotionally because they just study all the time. They don't really have a lot of time for relationships. They don't have time for friendships because like they, they go to, school and then they go to like an academy and then they go home and do homework so there's there's this there's this like really sad korean expression they say that uh, the less the less you sleep then the higher grade you'll get um but by the time they come to me that like i'm at university they um that's a time for them to have fun and just relax before they get into the workforce like university is the best time of their life uh, in, in the actual school system, before they get to university, they're taught to, to, to listen and not be heard, um, never question their, their educator. So critical thinking and constructive criticism are like level zero. Um, I, know, I know a lady who did her PhD dissertation in Korea, and her professor said that it was the opposite of what um, she believed. So she failed her. So she, that student took the same dissertation to New Zealand and she got an A plus. So yeah, Korean's education, I'm, to, I sh oh, well, I'm saying this live on YouTube. Okay. <laughs> Too late. The genie's out of the box. Yeah. Um, I'm not a huge fan of Korean education system, but neither are Koreans. Koreans will be the first to admit it that they're, um, they know there's a lot of problems with their education system and they're trying to change. There are some schools in Daegu, that's another city in Korea. They're trying, the public schools are trying out the International Baccalaureate Program or IB. It's a good kind of program that shapes minds and helps people. Um, they're also, Koreans are very jealous of what's going on in Scandinavia. Say, if you want to take um, Finland as an example, there are no private schools, 100% public schools. The students only study about four hours a day. So uh, pl playing outside is extremely important from kindergarten right up until university. They don't have any homework, but the average student there can speak about five languages because they give their minds a time to rest. Uh, happiness is more important than, than the subject itself. Like if you interview or meet a math teacher from Finland, he or she will say, the happiness of my students is the most important thing for me. Not like, uh, you know, X equals Y times whatever, you know. Um, moreover, in countries like in, uh, in like, France and Italy, they have two hour lunches. So they give them, they give the kids a lot of time to relax and play outside. And 
even the, and their lunches are really nutritious as well. Like they, they have cheese every day. They get a nice dessert. They're served like by waiters and waitresses. And like, if, if you look at an American lunch at a cafeteria, it's just really uh, very not, it's not very nutritious, but yeah. And, and, and in Slov uh, Koreans are also very jealous of Slovenia because in Slovenia, like in other countries like Finland, education, even for foreign students is free. So if you, if you go to university in Slovenia, there are over 125 programs in English that were developed in English specifically for foreign students and you don't have to pay tuition. And uh, yeah, one time the government there tried to charge started to try to charge tuition to the students and the students protested to the point where the government actually had to the, pre, the president of the country had to resign yeah so there's there's some koreans are aware that there's some really good things going on in other places and they're trying to reform like i have one student he's a master student i also teach i teach in the master program of translation and interpretation and he told me he wants his daughters to study art. He wants them to have fun. He refuses to send them to like an extra school activity, like academy. Um, you know, so I think the new generation of parents are have changed their minds. I think it's the old school mentality in Korea that like human pe people, are the only resource that Koreans had. It's not like a country full of like, mineral wealth or something so they kept thinking oh that we have to develop our children's minds so they can create a lot of stuff like you know hand cars and etc etc samsung phones but um nowadays they're starting to realize that you need creativity to you know you need innovative thinkers to to make these things you know and korea is going to stagnate if they don't develop their their minds and their critical thinking and language ability too. I mean, um, Koreans spend the second most amount of money in the world to study English, but their English level is not high whatsoever. It's just, they just study English as like a tool to pass an exam, but they don't study it as a, you know, an actual language. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So I, I uh, yeah, so I hope that, oh, I, and like, you know, I get a lot of freshmen, they come in directly out of the, you know, high school system. And they're so timid. They're, they're, they're terrified of me because I'm their professor. And it takes to honestly, like, it takes like a good nine months for them to kind of warm up to me. Because they've just been taught to, to obey and never question and sort of like, you know, be terrified of their teacher. So it's it's a from from my perspective as a Canadian, I just try to help them. I want to help them try to relax and take it easy in class. And I don't give exams. I, uh, the last time I gave an exam was probably like 2016. I I only give assignments. I give my students projects to work on, and they work on them for like four to eight weeks. And uh, just try to help my students relax because I know that in their other classes they're just going to get like a Korean professor who like talks to them for like an hour or two hours and they just cut the students just kind of fall asleep or they they look at their phone because it's like really boring <laughs> yeah. so um let's see who haven't I seen yet who haven't I talked to uh Grace hi did I talk to you yet Yes, no? sir. Uh, I did? Okay. Well, anyway, I'd like to ask you a question again. Um, what's the education system like in Indonesia? Oh, you were the one in the car. Okay, now I remember. Because you, <laughs> yeah, you had yes, the, mask, the mask on. I didn't recognize you. Mm. Uh, I think the educational system in Indonesia, we have formal... Uh, education for about uh, 12 years 
atau for primary school, uh, junior high school, senior senior school, and then we after we graduate, uh, we we want uh, we went to university, and in the senior high school, uh, the student. Um, The student may have uh, choose their major. Uh, I mean, like uh, whether they like to uh, science or social, uh, and then uh, it will become their uh, um, and focus. Yeah, they they focus uh, uh when they when they want to college. I think that's all that I can say. Okay, cool. What's the teachers st student dynamic like in Indonesia? Are are you guys like very sort of friendly with each other, or is it very top down? Like, is the educator the god, and 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 the kids have to like obey or like are, are you allowed to like argue and question your educator um do, do you guys do a lot of student-centered learning or is it like t very teacher-centered what do you think uh natasha do, do you are Are students encouraged to be free thinkers in um, like from elementary school up to high school or are, are you guys sort of like told to just listen and obey? Like what's the, edge, what's the dynamic like in the classroom? Well, uh, I think it's balanced between teachers and students. So uh, of course we as a students, we have to obey and to listen to the lecturer, to our teachers, but the teachers gave us Uh, like the opportunity to uh, like if we have an arguments but not like discussing about uh, the lesson the students can freely ask or giving opinions or asking for something if they don't understand so I think it's balanced between teachers and students in here okay cool good that's interesting thank you I didn't know that. I, I, I know when I, I lived in Indonesia for three years, but I only taught in the international school. So I, I really didn't know what was going on in um, local schools. So, um, hi, T Marlon, hi. Did, did you teach in a local Indonesian school before? Yes. Oh, okay. What grades did you teach? Uh, primary, school. <laughs> primary school so actually okay. it's just like uh, it's not really teaching but because the uh, Australian International School had to have a connection with the local school and then every once a week I have to visit the, the, the school next door to give mm -hmm. extra lesson for English and bring some of the students with me to teach this local school students over there. And yeah, but it's only once a week. Oh, I see. <laughs> but I used to teach, uh, uh, I don't have many experiences to learn teaching in a local school. Mostly my students are adults because I'm teaching English that's, that's all, instead of the general things. Okay. I see. Um, Hello, sir. Hi. Hi. Would you like to ask Hello, a question? Sir. Can I add something? Yes, sure. yes ma'am. <laughs> yes, you may. Um, Uh, I'm curious about about this. Uh, you said that you teach uh, in Korean, right? So, uh, it, does it mean you, you can't speak uh, Korean? So you teach in Korean, or you just speak? You just teach them in English? 
Um, well, I'm encouraged to speak only in English. I, I was told that the students actually don't like it when the foreign professors speak Korean. So I don't, I won't speak any Korean, which is fine because my Korean isn't that great. Um, I learned Korean when I first lived here a long time ago and any, any Korean that I still know is from that time. So I, I'm a little embarrassed, but I haven't learned too much. Um, actually, it's at one time I probably only spoke, I probably spoke better Indonesian than I did Korean. Um, yeah, and I, I, interesting dynamic. I don't mind so much if my students speak Korean in class sometimes because I want them to relax. Like if, they're base, if their level is like at a very basic level, um, I don't mind if they speak their native language because then eventually they, they just kind of stop. I don't really have to like enforce the rule. Like English only, you're gonna lose 5% if you speak Korean. You know, if I, if I be like, you know, a very strict teacher then they get even more nervous and so I, I try to make it a very relaxed and comfortable environment to study in and it just sort of goes away like but you know in if it is no magic number a few weeks or a few months but they just eventually stop speaking korean in class um yeah and um i believe in immersion and bilingual education a lot so I really like my students to use English only when they study with me. Uh, it, it doesn't matter what country I'm in, you know, Mongolia or Indonesia or, you know, Taiwan. I in, try to just, yeah, have them study. Uh, yeah, when I was at the Australian International School, I, I did a little bit of language arts, not too much, but I did a little bit. So that's where the students are uh, preparing themselves to sort of re-enter the mainstream. So they were studying uh, history and geography and science using um, English. The, the, I found those lessons, honestly, to be more enriching than just teaching the rules of English. So right now, like, for example, I'm, I'm creating a textbook but it's based on authentic English rather than, you know, you know, whatever, uh, ING is present continuous. Okay. So that means you're doing something in the moment. And that that's like, to me is so robotic and boring. Cause I mean, this, the young students have been learning that since they were in probably kindergarten and, or like another typical example, the bank is next to the post office. The post office is in front of the supermarket. I mean, these sorts of lessons have been done a million times and the students are really bored. They're also very bored of the typical subjects. Like, like, for example, there was this English textbook I was using in Taiwan and it taught middle school students like how to pay rent and how to negotiate a lease for an apartment and they were like 13 years old and i was just like why are they learning this the the person who wrote this textbook it wasn't thinking because you don't deal with that kind of thing until you're like 25 or 30 years old so so i'm doing this thing where i'm creating a textbook but trying to base it on um real vocabulary that the students will use. So for example, like uh, I created a chapter on travel and the students are learning about the hippie trail, the banana pancake trail, or um, something called after army. After army is like where people, the young people in Israel or Korea will have their mandatory like military service and then go overseas to travel. Anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm probably going too far into it, but basically I think it's important to teach my students about authentic tasks and authentic things that will help them for their future. So like I had a lesson called career day. So the students got into groups and 
each each uh, table had a theme. So half the class was walking around to different tables as though they were at like an international conference or an expo. And the students sitting down would teach their classmates skills about say like, how do you apply for a job? How do you write a good resume? What's a, what's a good way to give an interview? So that was their final exam actually. So I gave like two students the chance to sit at each booth for like an hour and then an hour later they switched and I was just walking around like a fly on the wall listening to them other times like I'll ask my students to do a film review but they, they create a poster about a particular film of course it's a, like an educational film like maybe something good about the environment and then they walk around and do a poster gallery walk and then so half the students will be presenting their poster and the other half will be listening and asking questions. And I'm just kind of walking around listening. And, you know, so rather than just like give them a multiple choice exam, which I don't know what the point of that is, that's not really teaching them anything. That a multiple choice exam is just easy for us as educators to grade, but it's very stressful for the students. I took a multiple choice exam when I did my teaching degree um, and it was very stressful because I had to answer 50 questions in like 60 minutes and my palms were sweaty and I was just so nervous. And I said, my God, I never want to put my students in the same situation. So another fun, another fun task that I give my students for a midterm or a final is called an event. So I say, okay, guys, you're a group of four. You're going to have one hour do anything you want do anything i don't care what it is so uh and you're go and then so like one group did yoga so that was really cool they and no, I, no one knew so they just they brought in mats and they brought in like chill out music and candles and stuff and they taught us yoga for one hour that was the final exam of course all in english uh, another guide is he was he's half uh, Egyptian, half Korean. He taught Arabic and he brought in like shawarmas and, and you know Arabic food. Um, there was another group that had a juice party. They brought in a blender and bananas and milk and like nuts and they taught us how to make smoothies and they taught us like the nutritional value of all the smoothies. And we stood around. And it was like, we we're drinking uh, the smoothies and talking. And I noticed that that dynamic of just not sitting at the desk, the dynamic of standing, it was, it, everyone relaxed and we were really able to talk to each other, students to students and students to me. So this, I think it's like, cause that's how you socialize when you're out, outside of school, right? You stand around, you talk, you talk to each other at parties and so, yeah, maybe when you when you guys become future educators, try to try to think outside the box. What are some things that you can do to break the mold? Get your students to do things they've never done before, because that could be good for them. Like when I another example is like when I worked at the Australian International School, I had five corners. So I had one listening corner. Um, where the, once a week the students would go and they sat on a sofa, they put, they put a headset on like this and they listened to YouTube videos about a movie and they answered a questionnaire. Uh, day, Tuesday, the same group would rotate and they would go to like a reading and conversation corner. I threw some pillows and a carpet on the floor and that's where they would read a book and then they would talk about it together. And then on Wednesday, they would go to the writing corner and they'd, they'd write an essay about the movie. On Thursday, they go to the textbook corner and there they would, well, you know, just do typical textbook work. And Friday, if everyone was well behaved, oh, let me back up, sorry. There was a fourth, sorry, a fifth corner, the coffee and tea corner. So the students had to like, uh, supply coffee and tea at this corner so that they could go there and take a break. They could drink coffee and eat cookies and stuff. And that was a really great place for them to relax. And then, okay, then on Friday, 
if everyone was well behaved, then we, because they were like an element, they were in uh, middle school, you know, so there's some kids who kind of, who kind of naughty, you know, so if, if, but if they're well behaved, and I said, okay, you guys can watch the movie on this day. They, we watched a movie on Friday, but I, of course, I press pause and ask questions and stuff. It's not just like, okay, you can take one hour off and just let the kids watch movies. You kind of have to, you start to teach, right? Yeah, so that's, that's an example. Another example of, you know, ways that you can do things, you know, if you're, if your principal, or your director is very open-minded and lets you set up the classroom the way you want, it's kind of cool, you know, rather than just kind of like throwing worksheets or a textbook at the students and just like talking for like one or two or three straight hours, at least you can try innovative things to your students later. Yeah. Well, oh, I think I should work with you, Marlon. I, I want to be a I want to be a teacher trainer. <laughs> Sounds good. Yeah. Okay. When my one year is up here in Korea, I'll call you. See what's going on at your university in Bandung. <laughs> That's a good idea. Mm, yeah. <laughs> what's a rabbit satay? <laughs> and and, and all the other delicious food that you guys talked about. <laughs> Uh, we're looking for it. <laughs> okay. So you visit someday after the COVID? <laughs> yeah, I'll definitely visit. Visit, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Bandung is in my top five, for sure. That's good. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I also want to visit um, Sum, Sumba Island. I, I like the Sumba. megalith. Sumba. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's a good a one. Hmm. Yeah. Not a lot of people get there, but it's kind of unique. Yeah. I mean, it's right. like the me megalithic stuff. Okay, sorry, go yep. ahead. It's all right. Uh, any more question, everyone? I have another one, ma'am. Okay, go ahead. Hear him. Um, Would you please uh, turn on your camera so can, we can see you after our, a year without, without having a class with you? So I have no idea what I, well about you anymore. Yes, that's nice. Okay. Oh, cool! You're outside. Um, I love to watch. I love to watching. I love watching Korean drama, and one of the drama, um, it's about education, where their their parents force their force their kids to learn more and more to to join a good university there because if if they can join a, a, a high class or a popular university there it's like this is kind of a pride for them and like you said before uh, the stress level of students out there is quite high and I want to ask, is it about a join uh, a popular university or a good school? It's just from the parents ask them to do that. Or maybe it's because their surrounding is like their friends, their environment in education. Thank you. Well, yeah, you're welcome. Uh, great question. Well, there are three things that you need in Korea to get a good job in the future. You need to have first uh, a degree from a good school. It doesn't matter what your major is. It just has to be from a great university. So priority number one would be to have like there, there's, there are basically like the top five or top 10 universities in Korea. You need to go to one of those universities, like Seoul National University or Yonsei, for example. The second thing you need in Korea to get a great job is, are connections, which you usually make at those universities. And third is to have a, a great looking face. Believe it or not, I'm not kidding. So that's why plastic surgery is so big in Korea. Um, like people, 
just basically deconstruct their face and make themselves look completely different. They'll even take growth hormone to like become taller and, you know, dye their hair. They'll spend like hundreds and thousands of dollars on clothing, you know, so, okay. To go back to your original question, it's, it's parents and uh, your friends as well as yourself. You have to go to a great university. If you don't get into like one of those top five, then you probably want to go to a university overseas. It doesn't really matter which one. As soon as it's from an overseas country, that's good enough. I mean, um, you know, one of the better, rep, you know, a, a, a country with a good reputation for education is important. Um, it So that if, as soon as you get into like a top, tier university then you can major in anything and it doesn't matter because you just went to a great university so you could major in like something like say for example the czech language it, you know i mean why would you need that right unless you're working for the embassy there isn't a lot of trade between korea and the czech republic but you could major in the czech language and you probably won't learn very much because you're going to spend most of your time um, playing video games or partying or doing things with your, just fooling around with your friends. But as soon as you get the name, you graduate, you've got the university's name, that's the most important thing. And um, a funny thing is about Koreans, it parents want you to to succeed, but it's also for their own pride. You know, so you can say that, oh, my son is a doctor, my son is a lawyer, my daughter's an engineer, my daughter is like, you know, uh, whatever, whatever. And then it's be like, oh, your son's a doctor, great. He can make, or she can make a lot of money. It's not like, oh, your son, your daughter is a doctor. She can save people's lives. She can help people recover from illness. No, it's more like she's a doctor. So I have a lot of, I can brag to my friends. It's the, the opposite reason of why you need to become a doctor, right? But, uh, or my, my daughter is an engineer. So she's going to create a lot of great things. No, no, it doesn't. That doesn't matter. It's just the fact that my daughter is an engineer and I can brag about it. Yeah. So it's, it is a lot of pride. Yeah. For parents, for sure. Yeah. If you don't go to a good university or you don't even go to university, then you'll be like the black sheep of the family and you'll be publicly shamed. So like, it's sad because right in grade, in grade, um, well, grade three of high school, there's this huge entrance exam that you have to take to get into university. It's like the SAT of Korea. And if you don't do well on that one day, then the future, your future is not going to be very good. So you have to have excellent test taking skills to have a great future in Korea. It's not necessarily a good thing or because I mean, for example, take someone like me, believe it or not, I got 60% in high school in English. Now, if I, if everything was determined based on my grade, I would never be where, where I am today, but I, I still managed to get two bachelors and two masters. I'm gonna to go to do my PhD. I worked in like several different countries around the world. What about the guy in Korea who gets a 60 on his SATs? And then he goes to like, you know, maybe the worst university in the country. And then later on, he's going to just be another brick in the wall, just another guy working in an office somewhere, like doing something that he doesn't like, you know? So it's, it's kind of like a sad situation actually to have your entire life based on a test, but that's because Koreans are really influenced by Confucianism and Confucius said to the people of Korea that your future is determined on taking an exam. So, yeah. Hmm. Hope that answered your question, uh, Hiram. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Where are you, Hiram? I see a nice, you're outside. Just looks like there's some nice palm trees or something behind you. Yeah, um, I live near uh, university, at Adventist University, Bandung. I live near to this place. Okay, it's always interesting. I always, like I said before, when when people are on Zoom and I see something very different in the background, like six months ago, I saw a student at a coffee shop and there were like bright lights behind her and a lot of waiters and waitresses going by. And I thought, I mean, that was very interesting to see. You know, some students sit on their balcony and I can see like the countryside behind, behind them and it's kind of fun to see. I have something from Indonesia underneath. I have a sitting in front of a something. And wait, these can, these are from Indonesia. Do you do you know where they're from? Can you recognize them? They by their clothing or their face. You know, do they look happy or sad? What do you think? Are they sad people or happy people? Sad. Right, they're sad. So that that's a hint. Where do you where do you think they're from? Then, if they if they are sad, so I'm trying to look for this other little person I have. Can't find it right now. Where do you think? What island? or province do you think they are from? Based on their facial expression. Any idea? Well, the, these, these guys come from a place where their houses look like boats. Anyone? Anyone? <laughs> Seems like we do need to learn about our own culture, though. <laughs> okay, I'll give you a hint. They have a very strong um, funeral culture there. Okay, I got these guys in Tana Taraja uh, in Sulawesi. Sulawesi yeah. Selatan. South Sulawesi. That's from Toraja. Uh, Rimanuela is one of the person from Toraja. Oh. But this she doesn't know. Um, ma'am, I'm from East Nusa Tenggara, ma'am. Oh, okay. Different, sorry. Uh, so, yeah. Actually, our culture has many uh, kind of things that interesting to learn about. So perhaps before learn another culture, we have to learn ours. <laughs> so <laughs> we are going to have a cultural celebration at the end of this program, Mike, where actually they are going to uh, present to us uh, their cultural dress, cultural uh, so traditional dress, traditional food, traditional song, as well as traditional, uh, what is that? Traditional what? what you know? Traditional food dress, song, and dance. So they are going to explain to us everything in English, but of course the traditional uh, song and uh, dance will be in, in our traditional. So uh, feel free to join us. Mm. Wow, I would love to see that. And then because most of them are from North Sumatra, so I am asking them to have different kind of dance and different kind of song, even though they are come from the same place. Okay. So I will let you know. Wow, that'll be <laughs> really fun. So it will be two weeks before the end of the class. So that's the other one that I'm going to, uh, the other project that I gave to them, because you know, just like you, I do not like to give them exam. Great. <laughs> Instead of doing that, 
that will be fun if we see something different. Okay, yeah, cool. Too bad we can't so, try some of the food. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Last, last, last year we did. We had in the classroom, they bring the food, traditional food and snacks, and then we chat together and uh, I ate the food together. And then we invite someone that like to join us. And then that was fun. Hear him experience that. Nofa and Halle, as well as Christy. Oh, okay. Well, lucky then. So, because of the COVID, so we cannot do that. <laughs> so, yeah, lucky them. Uh, hopefully next next semester or next year, we can do that again. Definitely. I, I agree. I, uh, yeah, I can't wait for this to be over. Um, yeah, some of my students made uh, Chinese food and even Vietnamese food in class. It was really, it was really fun at the time. Yeah, that's really fun. We can taste that one and then we know what is inside. And then we also know what the history behind the food. Mm, that's nice. Exactly. That's one fun aspect of teaching cooking through English because you can you can teach it's like a cross curricular activity. You can learn about the science, like what are the ingredients and uh, math, which you know you have to add a certain amount, add twelve grams or five hundred milligrams or things like that, and you can learn about the history, the nutritional value, and yeah, the culture. Yes, I yeah. agree. That's right. All right. Uh, any any more question, everyone? Uh, if no more question, otherwise we have to close because it go. It's time for. Uh, it's what time is it now in Korea? I guess it's about seven. Five five thirty five. It's time for dinner, right? <laughs> Almost, yeah. <laughs> All right, if there is no question, uh, once again, on behalf of the students, uh, I would like to ask, who's never have a turn yet to talk, uh, Beatrix, would you please say thank you to Mike on behalf of us? Okay, is it my voice clear, guys? Yes. Okay. Um, Hello, sir. I am Beatrix. Uh, as a representative, say thank you so much to you. Uh, we get lots of information about Canada plus Korea. <laughs> that uh, that as you know, we are love. Uh, half of us love Korea so much, <laughs> oh, right. including myself. <laughs> so. Um, <laughs> Maybe in another opportunity, we can go to your country, Canada. But I had already told to you, we should make money for it. <laughs> I guess. <laughs> Thank you. God bless you. Sure. Okay. Once sure. again, um, thank you very much, Mike. Thanks for being with us. And I really appreciate your time with <laughs> It will be it actually two hours and a half. That's a long time you spend with us. Yeah. And cool. <laughs> you have to stop. Uh, we have to stop because you have to have your dinner. Is there anything what you want to say to uh, the students, Mike? Well, I want to say uh, Tara McCassie, guys. I had, a, I had a good time. Thank you so much. It was cool to meet you. I don't get to see a lot of uh, people these days because of all the Corona crap. Oh, sorry, Corona stuff going on. So it was nice to see you and it was fun. I had a good time. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So once again, thank you, Mike. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us. Thank uh, you are welcome to join us again next week uh, for, uh, because that's the last time that we will have the native speaker with us. We are going to have Australian next week, Mike. Cool. Yeah. Good day, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> Good day. 
So, um, we are going to close our program today. Uh, I would like to say thank you again, Mike. I'll see you again next time. Please join us for the cultural celebration. Okay, I, I will. I, well, I, I will do my best to be there. Okay. <laughs>